uh, the National Human Rights Commission, but unfortunately, because of COVID, I could not. So I'm, I'm trying if I could find any other place where I could do my internship. Okay. Okay. So from which college you have pursued uh, law? Jaipur National University. My yes. professor was very good in international law. Professor V S Mani. Uh, he was a thought in space law, uh, international law, conflict law. And now no, he is no more. But he was he was an authority. Still he is an authority in international law. So, Arpit, Preet, they all are your junior, senior, or your batchmates. Arpit Dhaka. Um, not really sure, sir. So, thoda sa sir, we connect ho rahe hain. This is Balakrishnan and sir. Yeah. So, thoda sa wait karna padega. Okay. I am. I am here. Oh. Ah, sorry, sir. I'm here. Is it? Why? Uh, I, I don't know. Not video. Okay. Yes, sir. Huh? Uh, Audible? Yes, sir. Bring ma'am. Right, right, right. Put on my. Very good evening, sir. Very good evening. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Oh, uh, Shadi sir. Okay. Right, sir. Ma'am? Yes, yes, Abhimanyu. Yes. So, so shall we start then? Right. I, I just hope I'm clearly audible as well as visible. Uh, yes, ma'am. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'll start then. A very good evening to one and all present here. On behalf of Justice Dialogue and our associate partner, Jess Corpus, we warmly welcome you all for today's session on the topic COVID-19 and rule of law. Justice Dialogue, which is a youth-based, independent, and non-partisan think tank, is focused on doing legal work and policy research to make better laws. It was founded in July 2020, and we believe in enhancing informed legal and policy deliberations at various levels. Today with us, we have Ms. Mariyanka Singh. Ma'am completed her bachelor's degree in energy law from UPS, UPES Dehradun, and she further pursued her LLM from NLU Jodhpur. In 2019, she joined Manipal University, Jaipur, as an assistant professor, where she taught for a year. She's also cleared a UGC net examination in 2018. Jurisprudence and international law are her areas of interest. Additionally, she has also worked upon analyzing the legality of Bitcoin in India, which was a part of the hesitation to fulfill the master's degree. She's also an ardent supporter of holistic development. Having been actively involved in finance, fine arts, and fashion shows at schools and pre university levels, she was also the host for Miss Bihar in 2015. With this, I now hand over to Varen Kamal. Thank you, Abhimanyu, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm rather fortunate to be here on this forum with everybody. Uh, good evening, everyone. The king himself ought to be subject to God and the law because law makes him king. In the 13th century, Bracton, a judge in the reign of Henry III, in a way, introduced the concept of rule of law without naming it as rule of law. And this is one concept whose principles and tenets have been evolving ever since. COVID-19 has brought forth several new normals in front of us and the rule of law in its application is no stranger to it. A very good evening to all the esteemed dignitaries, senior academicians and dear students and participants. Today, we are gathered over this webinar organized by Dissolve Dialogue on the theme COVID-19 and the rule of law. The webinar aims to discuss 
various challenges and opportunities in observing the rule of law in a world absorbed in pandemic. Thank you for joining us for today's session. I'm Arianka, Assistant Professor, IMS Munison University, could be the moderator ensuring smooth conduction of the webinar. Today, we are immensely fortunate to have here with us distinguished members of the legal fraternity. Dear participants, please join me in giving our dignitaries the most cordial of welcomes. The keynote speakers of this webinar are Honorable former Chief Justice of India, Mr. K.G. Balakrishnan. We are pleased to announce that, that the webinar will be facilitated and addressed by Honorable Justice K.G. Balakrishnan, former Chief Justice of India and former Chairperson, National Human Rights Commission of India. Justice K.G. Balakrishnan was the first judge from the state of Kerala to become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. His tenure lasting more than three years have been one of the longest in the Supreme Court of India. Born on the 12th May, 1945, in Kotayam district, Kerala, Justice Balakrishnan enrolled as an advocate of the Kerala Bar Council in 1968 and pleaded both criminal and civil cases in Annakulam Court. He was appointed as a Munsif in the Kerala Judicial Service on the 10th January, 1973. Later on, he resigned from the service and resumed practice as an advocate in the Kerala High Court. In 1985, he was appointed as a judge of the Kerala High Court and was transferred to the Gujarat High Court in 1997. He became the Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court in 1998. And in 1999, he assumed charge as the Chief Justice of the High Court of Judicature at Madras. While being Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court, he also discharged duties of Governor of Gujarat for about two months and also as the member of the General Council of the Gujarat National Law University. In 2000, he was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court. He was sworn in as the Chief Justice of India on 14th January 2007 by then President APJ Abdul Kalam. After his retirement in 2010, he also served as the chairman of the National Human Rights Commission. It's remarkable that during his tenure as a judge, Justice Balakrishnan has delivered several landmark judgments dealing with constitutional and other matters, criminal laws and public interest litigation. These include an order which made the midday meal program in schools a statutory requirement. This order brought relief to millions of poor children who had to discontinue their studies due to poverty. In a Kerala High Court judgment, he asked the election commission to debar the political parties which imposed hartals on public, causing suffering and loss to many. He was part of the bench which held that courts could not interfere in criminal proceedings in public interest litigation. He was also on the bench that upheld the constitutional validity of a provision in the Representation of People Act changing the domicile norm for contesting elections to the Rajya Sabha. In 2007, in the case of Selvi and others versus state of Karnataka, the division bench headed by him held as unconstitutional forcible narco analysis, polygraph and brain electrical activation profile or brain mapping tests by the investigating agencies, which were raising concerns on the human rights of the people. Justice Balakrishnan has also stressed the need for a holistic approach for the upliftment of women in diverse fields of politics, education, and economy. Mr. Justice Balakrishnan has participated in a number of international seminars and delivered thought-provoking lectures in various universities on legal topics. Sir, I cordially welcome you on behalf of everyone. We are immensely fortunate to have you here on the forum with us. Okay. Our Hey. Next speaker. Right, sir. Our next speaker is Mr. Himanshu Sharma, advocate and president, Bhartiya Janta Yuva Morcha, Rajasthan. Mr. Himanshu Sharma is a prominent advocate and had started his respectable legal profession in 2013. He has also been guiding youth by organizing orientation programs for quite some time now. He has served as former co-convener 
of legal commentary of Bharatiya Janata Yuva Morcha. He has also served as the vice president of Bharatiya Janata Yuva Morcha. It is because of his philanthropic approaches and resilience with due confrontations of problems with society that Mr. Sharma has a repute of brilliance and is followed by many in this legal profession. Sir, we are very glad to have you on board with us. We welcome you on this session. Moving on, the term rule of law is derived from the French phrase la principe de legality, which refers to a government based on principles of law and not of men. In a broader sense, rule of law means that law is supreme and is above every individual. Like I mentioned just now, 2020 has been an unprecedented year, forcing us to adopt new ways of conducting our lives. Prima facie, this is definitely a public health crisis, but at the same time, we must not lose sight of related challenges that are consequential for containing this threat and for promoting a rapid and sustainable recovery. The struggle to uphold the rule of law is one of the foremost challenges in front of today. Our webinar today, for all the participants, it's very crucial to understand that this is based on discussing the intricacies of this struggle. A prominent <laughs> challenges, which include perceptions of bias, disproportionate use of force, and other human rights issues. Challenges like those of absolute and emergency powers resting with the state, can it undermine democratic institutions through its inordinate use? We have witnessed various incidents where testing and adequate treatment was not readily available to common man. While a part of India safely locked itself inside their homes during lockdown, there was another part of daily wage workers which was out on the streets returning to their villages on foot. This certainly makes us question the validity of rule of law. There is an urgent need today to avoid endearing harm to rule of law principles and fundamental freedoms. With that, I take the opportunity to invite Mr. K.G. Balakrishnan, Honorable former Chief Justice of India, to address our participants with his valuable juristic insights on the theme. So please. Good evening to all of you. <coughs> the rule of law Good evening. and uh, COVID-19. I repeatedly asked the young youngster who approached me, rule of law, I can understand. But what is the connection with COVID-19? So I was a little uh, uh, doubtful. What is the connection you are thinking of uh, rule of law with the COVID-19? Of course, uh, the rule of law. Then I thought that the whole judicial system is seriously affected by the pandemic situation. Large number of cases are pending uh, in various courts. Uh, we are not able to want, uh, it feels uh, um, one shudder what will happen uh, uh, if this continues for a continue, uh, fairly long period. Uh, already fairly long period, we are in trouble and uh, we are not able to conduct the regular litigation Courts are not opened. Judges are no meeting the law. Uh, no, the lawyers, lawyers are not able to convey their uh, arguments to the judge, and only some uh, cases are taken up. And uh, if in all the courts, uh, civil, criminal, and the high courts and Supreme Court, uh, the large number of cases are likely to uh, come and. Uh, uh, without any proper uh, uh, argument or uh, decision, uh, this will lie down there for a long period. So they, there is, a, in virtually, there is a failure of the role of law in that sense, uh, the, because the basic uh, thing of rule of law is the supremacy of law. That is the first, uh, dicey is actually, when we say about dicey, <clears throat> That he explained, he explained the in his uh, celebrated book Law and the Constitution. He wrote that book, uh, and he gave the uh, what are the principles of uh, the rule of law. The we often uh, also remember Edward Cock, the Chief Justice of uh, England. Uh, the, he, he he stood against the James the, the first uh, and said uh, the 
it is the business of the judge to decide and the, <coughs> the king cannot interfere in that so then the dicis principle itself uh, the supremacy of law equality before law predominance of legal right he dicis was even uh, little critical about the administrative the, the so many tribunals deciding cases in those days so it is uh, the, but uh, nowadays that is that we cannot uh, say to be against the <clears throat> the rule of law because a large number of cases are being uh, considered but the 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 we we normally say seven principles of law law and order that is the every state should have the law and order situation and that is one day rule of law when we say there is a rule of law in the country then the we say we mean that the law and order situation is really good no interference by it. then the fixed rules we should know what is the rule not on the basis of what is uh, who is going to be governed by the rules uh, fixed rules uh, then elimination of discretion or we, of course uh, we cannot eliminate the discretion in all uh, but the uh, the discretion rights uh, exercised by the court or the administrative authorities has got a problem of uh, the discretion being exercised in favor of their favorites so that is the discretion elimination of discretion but we cannot completely eliminate the discrimination because it is dis I mean, discretion discretion is always uh, in any decision discretionary principle should be but it shall not be used uh, with, <coughs> without any principle it should not be uh, applied without uh, in a biased way this discretion based on the certain valid principles then due process of law that is we call in the american constitution you know due process of law the fairness the law anybody who is seeking redress of any remedy under law should have their due process of law their fairness in the decision making process should be the fairness then the natural justice everybody knows what is natural justice a right to be heard and the that is the natural justice the the very basic uh, thing of natural justice the preference for judges that is the dicey first said the the preference for judges rather than executive uh, members deciding matters in some parts of india the north especially northeast the all uh, judicial matters were also decided by executives with uh, much difficulty after a collaborative discussion and all the exit powers of the executive magistrates were dissected and changed and the judicial magistrate the judicial system have come into force in the northeastern states so the preference for judges judges uh, have to decide the matters not the executive authorities then the the last is a judicial review of administrative action any administrative action taken by the executive should be subjected to judicial review all these principles are under various provisions are incorporated in our constitution so the right to equality is there equal by equal that is equal protection of law nobody shall be <coughs> arrested uh, uh, without the uh, under uh, with the uh, without the there being a proper uh, procedure established by law all these uh, are incorporated in our constitution that is the basic the fundamental rights or some of the, in the even directive principles of state policy all these rights are the, the the incorporated in the constitution very carefully in the day and also the three organs of the state uh, that is the separation of powers is that is also there in our constitution executive is different judiciary is different and parliamentary system is different <clears throat> and all these uh, the different uh, organs of the state have been given powers and they they shall not interfere each other in these powers that is also there the three organs of the division of powers separation of powers 
this is also in the, in the in our constitution and uh, the all these our uh, <coughs> decisions uh, are also in the various decision the all these are uh, the reflected various decisions supreme court the principles are yeah, even though in, a, in a, the only observing all these principles uh, have been uh, a, and one important yeah, this our judicial independence that is also basic concept of rule, rule of law our judicial uh, and uh, in uh, one instance uh, the we have even uh, the said uh, one uh, uh, you, you all law students maybe uh, adm jabalpur case uh, where the we the uh, said uh, supreme court said that is always uh, taken uh, as a uh, very uh, decision not in accordance with the the rule of law because we said when the the emergency was declared the fundamental rights is kept in abeyance it cannot be article 21 cannot be exercised that is <laughs> it has no force and the, the the very famous judge just hr khanna said no no fundamental uh, right and article 21 is based whether it is uh, constitution is there or not the rights that right fundamental right is born rights once you are born that right is there nobody can challenge and take away that rights that is the decision ad the, the minority judgment in the ad in jabalpur case and uh, i need not explain as so many other speakers are there i don't want to take more time these are the basic principles of uh, rule of law which uh, we we follow strictly and uh, whenever we say that anything illegally happening anything executive authority take a decision and uh, the judicial review principles are fully incorporated in article 32 of the constitution and article 226 of the constitution if any decision is taken one can uh, the immediately challenge the challenge it challenge the this is the uh, same <coughs> by the uh, before the court so the that is also judicial review principles of judicial review of administrative action that is also we have taken it and uh, these are all the basic principles of judicial review which uh, we all follow and uh, we are very careful whenever is we divert from the principles of this uh, rule of law then we say we are the state is in an anarchy so state is not following the rules so the state is bound to every every decision maker either collector or revenue officer or customs officer they are they are on the wrong path we say the the state is not following the rule of law so the this is this is basically thing and i i hope i know um, these are all the basic things uh, which uh, in pandemic uh, situation our uh, life is a uh, uh, oh, uh, little miserable and uh, we hope that the this situation will uh, <coughs> will be over as early as possible so that we can have a, the these sort of seminars and uh, discussions alone is possible and uh, we hope i let the other uh, participants express their views with this anything if any any time i can also join with the in the course of the discussion thank you thank you very much thank you uh, thank you so much sir uh, for uh, actually illuminating and uh, discussing various important and crucial pillars that we require Uh, concepts like elimination of discrimination the due process of law fairness in decision making process principles of natural justice that we cannot dispense uh, away with judicial independence judicial review and how all the stakeholders uh, in this democratic setup 
have to especially and particularly and will uh, vigil uh, vigilantly i'm sorry uh, follow the rule of law especially in times of a pandemic uh, so we are immensely fortunate uh, that you could spare some time and join us and let our participants uh, know your wa valuable insights on this topic uh, and so we look forward to having such discussions with you in your future sir once the pandemic is over sir the best possible sir thank you so much sir Okay. Should I continue, or are they all right? I can take leave. Uh, sir, uh, sir, I'm afraid, sir, sir, there is a question and answer ah, around also, no. sir. But I will, I'll wait. I have no problem. My work today. Sir, if at all. Before. Yes, I will time, wait. Sir. No problem. No problem. Okay. I'll wait. Right, I'll wait. Okay. I will. Thank I'll, you. Thank I'll, you, I'll you so much. Also, hear the other speakers' uh, views. Right, okay. Sir. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on. Now I take this opportunity to invite our next speaker, Mr. Himanshu Sharma, Advocate and President, Bharatiya Janata Yuva Morcha. Uh, sir, please, I now request you to address our participants and give us your valuable insights on the topic. Sir, please. Honorable Justice K. G. Balakrishnan Sahab, Madam Maryanka, Team Jasol Dialogue. rule of law and covid 19 uh i believe that it is very easy to discuss rule of law separately and covid 19 separately but it is very difficult to connect both of them but to connect both of them or to understand rule of law and covid 19 together i would like to divide the issue in two parts the one part is in that part we will discuss how the contract may be enforced or performed during covid 19 period first part or the second part is how the law may be enforced during covid 19 period or courts are working during covid 19 period the first part which we are going to discuss is more academician or more academic part and the second part is practical part how contracts may be performed or performance under the contract may be done it has its answer in contract act we will have to see the contract if the contract has force measure clause or not if it has that clause in that case whether the co situation of covid is covered by that clause or not if it is covered by that clause in that case i think question may arise that only lockdown period would fall within the purview of force major clause or the period subsequent to the lockdown would also fall within the purview of force major clause one point of discussion uh, regarding frustration of contract may also arise if one is not going to take up the issue of force major clause but this issue is i think more academic issue and uh, i believe that courts are working on this and all these issues are before the courts district courts high courts i think courts will answer these in their adjudication process the another aspect which we have created that is more practical and i think all the academicians all the judges all the lawyers they are facing and they are ex, ex, um, they are facing that aspect the aspect is how the courts are work, working during that period and whether courts are successful in enforcing the law during the covid 19 period i believe that right now we can only discuss because the history will be written after 50 or 100 years at that point of time historian will see whether at this point this point of time courts are working properly or not academician will write whether this tenure or this time during this time courts was judiciary was successful or not but right now we can see 
what problems lawyers are facing what problems judges are facing and uh, we can um, take this issue from the perspective of litigation litigant also as we all know i think this is the first time when we have seen courts working virtually and in my personal experience not only some lawyers were uncomfortable with virtual courts but i have experienced that some judges were also uncomfortable with the virtual courts as a young lawyer i may be happy with the virtual courts but we have seen that there are senior lawyers uh, senior uh, judges they were all were not comfortable with the virtual courts but we will have to appreciate the endeavor of the bar bench in imparting justice during this tough time also at high court level the courts were taking only urgent matters and even at uh, i think subordinate courts level also the courts were taking urgent matters and this this is this is not my personal experience i think uh, justice k g balakrishnan saab will also agree that uh, if uh, it is to be adjudicated that what is urgency i think this is psychological aspect for advocate everything is urgent for litigant everything is urgent and i think judges work on different aspect judges may decide that whether this matter is urgent or not but i have seen that i think psychological uh, urgency is a psychological aspect if this is my matter it is urgent matter but during covid time i think lawyers were also deciding that if i have 10 matters only 3 matters are urgent and he will prefer to argue only 3 matters thereafter judges judges will choose high court will choose or lower court trial court judges will choose which matter out of these 3 matters are urgent so i think there was a cooperation from the judges side there was a cooperation from the lawyer side and due to cooperative efforts we were we have been able to face this time the failure which i see from the perspective of a young lawyer is at two level i think at the district level there was lack of infrastructure and if at the metropolitan metropolitan court there was a infrastructure in that case His staff was not well versed with the virtual courts and how the courts can uh, courts proceedings can be conducted virtually. So, I I think we should work on that. That not only judges should be well versed, not only lawyers should should be well versed, but apart from our staff, our uh, even lawyers, uh, uh, staff of uh, lawyers' office as well as the staff of judges, they must be well versed with the. proceeding how the proceedings can be conducted virtually apart from the courts i think litigate litigant faced so much problem at the level of tribunals this is a this is a pro, uh, this is a period where we have seen so much tribunalization you cannot approach high court earlier when in uh, 2000 2001 2002 i think not much tribunals were created and people were approaching high courts under 226 of the constitution of india but in uh, i <coughs> entered into, the, uh, into practice in 2013 and we have seen that there are there are so many writ petitions writ petitions are being dismissed on the ground of availability of alternative remedy that alternative remedy is available you approach alternative remedy <coughs> where is the alternative remedy <coughs> alternative remedy is available at the tribunal level sdm courts and different courts at these sdm courts these courts were totally shut they were not because they were involved in the management of covid 19 because they are they are administrative officers so they were involved in the management of covid 19 so at that point of time if litigant wants some stay at that point of time he was facing so much problem i would conclude with the advantage of this virtual courts proceedings i know that 
we want to appear court physically but ultimately i see in post covid period we do not want to appear through uh, uh, virtually but i believe that we are going to enhance our skills how to manage our office earlier if you have one office in delhi you have one office in jaipur and another office in another city you were commuting from one place to another place another place to that place but now i believe and i i think that if courts are not going to work virtually and we would prefer to appear physically because if i am appearing physically in that case i would be able to assess the court in more efficient manner but i believe that my office can be managed my office can be managed virtually if i have office in delhi i need not to go to delhi on weekly basis on monthly basis i can manage it virtually and i i advise all the lawyers who are participating in webinar that yes we would have to work hard we would have to see that how we can appear in more courts how we can manage our offices in different cities so i think this is an arm and this time has taught us taught us so much and we are waiting that covid would be over but uh, these teachings are going to be with us thank you very much thank you sir thank you uh, so much uh, mr himanshu for uh, acclimatizing our uh, participants on the various uh, major impediments that the delivery justice system is facing during times of this pandemic the pros <coughs> of the system and various endeavors that have been employed by every stakeholder in ensuring that there is no miscarriage of justice even if at at such difficult times thank you so much sir uh can we uh, open the house for questions can we sir have the question answer round yes honorable uh, yes right sir sir there are i'll just sir uh, get on the hold of questions sir couple of questions have been sent by our participants hmm sir i'll just read out the questions to you uh, read out yes right sir right sir just a second sir yes sir uh, uh honorable chief uh, former chief justice uh, sir uh, i'll just read out the question the first question uh, reads out that india's lockdown is in administrative measures taken under the central disaster management act 2005 or by states under the colonial epidemic diseases act 1897 neither of them are a covid 19 specific act effect of which was there was many irregularities in orders irregularity in transportation which left millions of people stranded without work and without any replacement support to survive the restrictions were sometimes brutally enforced by police such scenarios question the validity of rule of law in times of pandemics it raises concerns that what approach supreme court should adopt so that rule of law can be established in such times or the courts should adopt hands off approach claiming it to be an administrative inefficiency so that's the question court can always interfere and give appropriate directions the court cannot simply sit uh, this is uh, administrative decision all administrative decision could be challenged uh, if it is violative of the basic principles of law if it affects the seriously affect uh, the <clears throat> people that is why the by even the public investigation and all what is happening in jails what is happening uh, by the administrative officers uh, court can always interfere policy decision only one thing is uh, that is uh, uh, yes government has adopted a particular policy court shall not interfere and change uh, no this policy is not good uh, 
government should not adopt that policy that that such a prerogative is not with the court but the implementation of any policy decision or anything which seriously affect the rights of the people then court can always uh, either uh, interfere it and prevent it or uh, once that uh, the appropriate guidelines can be issued uh, there is nothing wrong in interfering in such matters uh, even the public investigation if you look into the various public investigation and the judgments issued by the uh, courts uh, it is greatly and especially for the delhi people uh, there you, you you may not uh, know there are large number of uh, the industrial units in delhi and the uh, the and all there were pursuant to the judicial decision of the supreme court all these industrial units were taken out of the delhi and was and started elsewhere out of the suburban areas this is all all uh, we strictly speaking this is uh, uh, maybe from a conservative point of view what is the authority of the court to do all these things uh, you may ask uh, so but uh, if for the protection of the rights of the people appropriate direction can be issued uh, we cannot uh, shut our eyes or um, shrug our shoulders or just uh, by saying that this is administrative or policy decisions <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much sir that was a question uh, put forth by miss ananya the next question uh, sir has been asked by uh, mr dipendra another participant i would like to humbly put forth the next question also uh, so which reads out that uh, whether workers getting food is good enough to satisfy the judicial conscience does requiring further consideration of any issue related to wages or other entitlements how many of them do actually get food or shelter or who are the millions marching on foot traveling on cycles and rickshaw carts is considered as executive matters what role judiciary can play in ensuring these human right needs of people right sir so that's the question uh, similar to the earlier question it is uh... it is a serious violation of human rights we but it was we are not handled this, this sort of situation suddenly it happened when the lockdown was declared people lost their job they lost their employment they lost wages a large sections of the community was thrown into penury and poverty and serious even now many of many of the such people suffer they have no employment how many employers will pay wages when the um, no work is extracted from them so it is still a for the last number of people uh, they have no place to stay no job then uh, they were also under the impression they are not going to get any wages so how do they feed them uh, they their children so they left uh, and a large number but uh, from uh, hindsight we feel that this their sufferings could have been a little more uh, attention could have been paid and alleviated uh, and the, that uh, that uh, <clears throat> that could have been done uh, but uh, it is um, now, even now it is uh, that that sort of sufferings are being continued we get the reports in the newspaper that uh, they are they are uh, many of them are uh, is seriously affected by the covid situation right sir uh thank you so much sir so there is just one more question sir uh, okay. yes sir uh so this has been co jointly put up so sir the question reads out uh, that uh, putta swami judgment established right to privacy as a fundamental right mandatory installation of arogya setu app and the way it works can we say that it is itself violated violative of the privacy of an individual right to privacy is now recognized as a fundamental right that is uh, is a uh, we have to welcome that decision the right right to privacy but this uh, sometimes the 
uh, we make use of the technology and the technology has certain defects uh, so it is uh, some something it is put on the web or anything then uh, it could be somebody else could make use of it and to make it uh, but uh, in a large country like this uh, we should have our own identity either this uh, this aadhar and all the, we cannot uh, simply say that i am a citizen i don't want to divulge anything of uh, my private affairs it is it is not a um, we should disclose not very personal things but disclose our identity in the sense that there is nothing wrong in it we, we should be proud that i am we are a citizen of this country and uh, anything what is uh, our our personal details are disclosed uh, nothing is going to happen and we shall not cling on to the the right to privacy in these matters that is all divulged and all but the authorities also should be careful in seeing that the some of the information collected by the officers for the purpose of insurance um, education health uh, or anything shall not be lightly divulged to others but in this technology is uh, spread over the whole world so yeah. whatever happens uh, we see the moment the whether trump or biden uh, who one day we, within the seconds we know that so that is a, that is the advancement of uh, technology so we cannot uh, some of the details are diverge we need not be so touchy about these things that is a uh, whenever we make use of the technology we have to uh, think that the technology may have some disadvantage also so I, anyway it's a right to privacy is a, a valuable right one can uh, the proper putta sami case is uh, that i think uh, Uh, these these matters are still uh, being considered by a larger bench or something like that it is still uh, so we cannot uh, take uh, in these matters we cannot say final word uh, at any point of time thanks uh, thank you sir uh, honorable sir uh, sir uh, we would also take a views of himanshu sir and sir there is one more question sir if you could bear ah. with us for five more minutes <laughs> okay <laughs> so so just five more minutes if you could bear with us uh, uh himanshu sir there's a question that has been put forth by mr anisur uh himanshu sir am i audible to you yes yes go ahead right sir sir i'll read out the question um uh, the question reads out just a second sir yes sir uh that in context of vaccine distribution uh, india must consider two key questions how may india get access to a covid-19 vaccine and if it does how will it ensure fair and equitable distribution among its large and diverse population do you think such fair distribution can be ensured without the intervention of uh, courts and other authorities see first of all our government is making endeavor that uh, we should not be the importer of vaccine and we should export the vaccine and i think government is going to export only once we are self sustainable one thing secondly as far as vaccine distribution is concerned it is difficult for a country like india but uh, as health minister has also stated that firstly and even who is emphasizing on this that firstly it will be distributed amongst those who are more vulnerable who are needy like senior citizens pregnant women i think in this manner government will make a policy and on the basis of that policy it will be distrib- distributed and yes uh, if there is a uh, there is any violation of that policy our courts are there right sir thank you so much sir uh, honorable uh, balakrishnan sir there is one more question for you sir uh, <laughs> if you would permit sir i'll read okay. out okay 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 be the last question sir thank you so much sir i'll read out the question sir okay uh, right sir 
sir the question reads out that sir uh, you have remained the president of nhrc for a significant amount of time you yes. saw this institution growing and getting a prominent place in field in the field of human rights people look towards this institution as something that can safeguard their human rights and their effective implementation do you think nhrc is able to play that role that it needs to uh, be keeping in mind that it is the apex institution for the protection of fundamental rights in this uh, is this right that the way nhrc act is drafted it makes nhrc a toothless tiger heavily reliant on government even for the basic things what are some suggestions to take this institution towards the level it deserves so that's the question all nhrc is a commission all commissions are recommendatory body so it is not an executive organ where they their decisions are to be implemented ruthlessly by executive officers but uh, i must say if whenever there is nhrc directions are issued then the that is completely obeyed 99% such directions are obeyed by the state so no state would raise any objection that is only very carefully uh, the orders are passed when there is a violation of human rights but the violation of human rights in a country like india large country like india um it is we earlier only received petitions uh, complaints uh, from various uh, states but when uh, we felt that the violations are really happening inside the in the interior parts of the country so it is in our villages so we started going to we started going to the places we went to rajasthan maharashtra chatisgarh tamil nadu up um bihar and all those places and conducted the received compliance uh, aid the people directly then only we realized that the human rights violations are happening and we gave thereafter after the, the uh, we meet the officers uh, we meet the concerned officers uh, the home secretary and uh, senior officers of the state and give appropriate directions uh, some of them they are also not aware of the what is really happening in the country so the it is a very powerful in that sense uh, to come the <clears throat> it is not a court so it is uh, we cannot say that it is a toothless organ it is protecting the rights of the people and it is a poor men's court uh, so that is uh, that is nobody can uh, uh go to court uh, it sometimes it may be very expensive so the way a simple complaint uh, to the human rights commission may solve the problem of that uh, that person that is in large number of such petitions uh, complaints are sold and uh, we give appropriate directions to the various officers government they are all complied with fully complied with there is um, i i don't agree with the view that it is a toothless uh, organ right sir, right sir. right sir. thank you okay. uh, so much sir thank so, you so much sir thank sir, you uh, thank you right sir uh, himanshu sir there is a last question for today's forum that has been addressed to you sir i'll just read out the questions and then we will be done with the question answer round uh, himanshu sir i'll read out the question uh it it says that we saw the effect of corona on legal profession as well large number of advocates found it extremely difficult to navigate through this phase due to paucity of money bar councils played their part by disbursing amount uh to from advocates welfare fund to needy advocates so what young lawyers can do along with litigation in their early days in order to make a decent living for themselves also a lot of law students and professionals felt depressed and demotivated during this phase uh can you give away a few words for encouragement for them himanshu sir yes maryanka it is true that it is a tough profession for young lawyers like us and the situation during covid period was it it is very unfortunate that uh, lawyers chose to 
go in uh, other fields but uh, i think we uh, as a young leader i do, uh, not only think about lawyers young lawyers but i also think about our munshis our office clerks and uh, i raised voice about them also as far as uh, young law students are concerned i think uh, the covid is not permanent uh, i think in two months three months four months it is going to go so thereafter even young lawyers have so much scope to go in this profession to rise in this prof profession and there is a saying that uh, in hindi sanyam aur sambhavnaye saath saath chalti hain patience if we will keep patience it will give us opportunity so keep patience with you i think we have so much opportunities in future and we will do uh, we not only we are not going to do much for us but we are going to do for the society and this is a profession where we are not earning money but we are we are doing social work so keep doing social work keep patience we we are going to have so much opportunities don't worry about that thank you okay thank you thank you, thank you so much thank, thank you, you so much thank sir you, uh, now i would uh, invite himangini a student from manipal university uh, jaipur to propose a vote of thanks to our dignitaries for being here okay 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 himangini <coughs> over to you thank you so much ma'am good evening everyone greetings everyone on behalf of chasual dialogue we feel delighted to express our deep note of gratitude and warm regards to our honorable and respected speakers honorable justice balakrishnan sir former chief justice of india and advocate himanshu sharma sir president bharatiya janata yuva morcha for accepting our invitation and donating their time and sharing enlightening knowledgeable value inputs thank you balakrishnan sir and himanshu sir surely our audience would have learned from every bit of the session thank you to ms marenga ma'am our moderator for sharing the session through so smoothly we would also like to thank our associate partners jus corpus publishing partner itching the patch and all our media partners for their assisting hand lastly but not the least we would like to thank our audience for attending the webinar and making it a successful one thank you everyone and best wishes Thank you thank you thank you thank so you. much Thank you sir Thank you Himanshu sir Thank you thank you, thank you everyone can i disconnect puran can i disconnect Yes ma'am Thank you <laughs>